told the story before in a number of different ways. So if you've been here with us for a while at Grace Chapel, you've probably heard this story before. So bear with me, but, uh, but I'm going to pull something a little bit different out of it than I have before. Um, my second to last year in college, I was working as a student leader, and, uh, and I found myself at a place where I was, I was girlfriendless, which is really bad when you're going to a Christian college, right? Like at a Christian college, uh, you know, you go there to, to get a degree in a number of different things, and one of those is the MR and the MRS degree as well. And so, you know, I'm, I'm on the lookout, hoping that uh, maybe one of these new freshman girls that comes in will give me that MR degree that I've been looking for. Uh, and I'll give her her MRS degree, and it'll be perfect, right? So, um, you know, that's what, that's what I was hoping for. And so there was this moment where, um, where my wife, Lori, walked into the school cafeteria, and I can remember like, right in that moment immediately just kind of having this, this draw and this curiosity about her, like right there in that moment. I was there as a student leader again, and so here I am meeting all the people that are coming in for the first time, um, and I, I was, had been there for, uh, for, for orientation and as, as well. And so Lori walks in with her family for the first time. And I, you know, I'm having conversations with everybody. And so I talk with her for a little bit, with her family for a little bit. And then I figure out real quickly that she actually comes from the same hometown that my best friend Bob's girlfriend also comes from. And then figured out as well that Bob's girlfriend, Elizabeth, who played on the basketball team, well, Lori was going to play on the basketball team too. And I'm starting to put some things together. And I'm working angles. And I'm thinking, how can I figure this whole thing out so that maybe our paths can cross every now and then? I mean, I don't want you to get this idea that I was a creeper, but I was a creeper. <laughs> right? I'm, I'm coming up with all these strategic ways that I can, I can get in places where she'll take notice of me. You know, so I'm thinking, okay, hey, Bob, listen, talk with Elizabeth and see if Elizabeth can find Lori to and invite Lori to sit with you all at lunch, and I'll just kind of happen to walk up. It'll just be something that sort of happens. I mean, it won't be planned at all. It'll just be, you know, it'll be totally by accident. I'll just walk up. I'll sit down at the lunch table and then see if you can get maybe Elizabeth to figure out, you know, kind of what her class schedule is even. So you figure out what her class schedule is, and then I'll just happen to pop around the corner when she's coming out of class somehow. See if you can figure out these times where maybe we'll, you know, we'll just walk across or you stumble across each other at the student center where, you know, where our paths will cross by accident but on purpose so that maybe she'll take notice of me because I'd taken notice of her. So she'd caught my eye and what I was trying to do was put myself in these positions, these places where maybe she'd see me and maybe she'd take notice of me as well and it, it took a while. Maybe you've been in a, in a place like that as well yourself. I bet you 50% of the married people even if you're looking at me like I'm strange right now, 50% of the married people in this room have probably done the same thing. And if you're thinking I didn't, that's because your spouse did. Right? That's because your spouse was thinking, how can I put myself in a certain place to where maybe she'll take notice of me, he'll take notice of me, somehow we'll lock eyes and it'll be that magic moment, right? Where, where we just see each other and we know. I love that story because eventually, obviously, Lori, well, either she just got so tired of this guy who kept putting himself in places where she was like, all right, whatever, fine. Or maybe she did take notice of me, and I'll go with that one because it sounds a whole lot better, right? But I do enjoy telling that story and sharing that story, but it, but it brings to mind this reality in life, especially as a follower of Jesus and as one who's supposed to be a disciple maker, right? A maker of disciples. Jesus said, go into the world. I want you to go and I want you to teach. I want you to baptize. I want you to make disciples as you go. That is the call on your life. That's the mission on your life when you accept the call to follow Jesus. What I'd love to have a whole bunch of stories of is, is the way that God worked through me and put me in strategic places so that I could share his goodness with others, so that I could share the gospel story, so that I could disciple them. Because just by living in a certain way, in a sense, maybe speaking in a certain way, they took notice. I'd love to have story after story of that, and I think a lot of you would too. I think somewhere in, in our hearts, we realize as believers and followers of Jesus, so I'm going to kind of give away the landing place for this morning's message right at the front. 
we know that we should live in such a way that compels others to take notice. And not, not of ourselves, but they would see something in us that would point them to the one who loves us and the one we love as well. So this month, we're, we're in this series. We're going to be in this series for the whole month of November. And uh, many times in November, we think about either f- being thankful or we talk about generosity, something along those lines. But I want to look at it from this angle this month, that, that our generosity ought to tell a story. And this is a series about giving, serving, and living as the people of a good God. And so we're going to be asking ourselves this question this month. What kind of story do I tell as I live my life? What kind of story do I tell about God? In a minute, we're going to jump into the text, but before we do, let's just pause and pray and invite God to be a part of this conversation. Father, I pray that you're the one leading this conversation this morning and that the words that will come out of my mouth will honor you, will represent you well. I pray that your Holy Spirit would be at at work among us, moving among us, so that as we speak about you, he will be working to connect some deep truths and root them in our lives. I pray that as we ask this question this month, what kind of a story am I telling about you, God. That right now, whatever place we are, wherever we happen to be, that you will convict us within our hearts, that our lives, that our story can be one that points others to you. And that through sharing, through living, through loving as the people of a good God, we can point people to that good God. Would you help us do that this month, God? This I pray in your name, and the church said, amen. Well, if you've got your Bibles, we're going to begin in Acts chapter 2 this morning, and then we're going to jump around just a little bit because I want to try to build the case for you, again, that we ought to live in such a way that tells a story about the God we serve, that we ought to live that way. We ought to live in such a way that, that draws notice to our good God in everything we do. So if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Acts chapter 2, verse 42. We're going to start there and read through 47. And I want you to just see just a little bit about this community. This, this, uh, the, what we hear in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47, comes at the conclusion of this incredible sermon that the Apostle Peter preached. It was the first gospel sermon where 3,000 people responded They give their life to Jesus, they repent, they're baptized, they lay down their old life so they can pick up a new and start living in a new story. And Peter tells us, or Luke tells us, at the end of this passage, just what happened, what the early Christians did after having repented, being baptized, laying down their old life to pick up a new. And this is where we pick up. Luke says, So they devoted themselves, all those who are now believers, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Now, I want you to just picture in your mind what Luke is describing. This group of Christians, this happened on the day of Pentecost, this first sermon was preached where where a whole bunch of Jews were in Jerusalem celebrating this feast of Pentecost. And as Peter preaches this sermon, as there are these signs and wonders that are revealed that validate his message, a large group comes to Christ that day. And the Christian community is formed that day. And they start to live in a whole new way. They start to live like Jesus would have them live. They start to accept the call to be disciples who make disciples in everything they do. And so some things happen out of that. They devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. They're getting together and they're sharing communion. They're breaking bread with each other. They're fellowshipping with each other. They continue to worship with each other. 
that they're, they're so much in love with each other and the message and, and the mission they've been given that they keep meeting together. They have everything in common. They start to sell property because they see that others have needs. Luke goes on to tell us that every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. And then they broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Just, just picture the vibe of this community. The way they were relating to each other, engaging with each other. They were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And, their Lord, and the Lord added to their number, I, I love this little summary statement right here, daily those who are being saved. Now, this isn't the only summary statement of what was happening in the early Christian community in the book of Acts. In fact, just two chapters later, we have another summary statement that tells us much the same as what we just saw at the end of Acts chapter 2. Again, Luke tells us this. He says, all the believers were one in heart and one in mind. They were so united that you could call them both one in heart and one in mind, Luke says. Now listen to the way they lived this out. It says, no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. I love this next statement as well. Luke says, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them. I mean, Luke is in a way trying to get us to ask the, question, ask the question, what happens when God's grace is powerfully at work among his people? What happens? What does that look like? And here's what Luke tells us. He says, God's grace was so powerfully at work in them, in all of them, that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Again, picture in your mind this community and the way they were living and engaging with each other. Hold on to some of the things that Luke tells us about them. Their generosity was boundless. Their generosity was compelling. Luke tells us at the end of chapter 2 that every day there were people who were coming to Jesus as they watched the way this new community, remember those who had laid down their old lives to pick up a new, to pick up the life of Jesus, the new life of Jesus. There were those watching and every day the way they were living and what they were doing was so compelling that people were coming to faith daily. Not just at Sunday services and not just at summer revivals and not other things like that, not big events, not people were coming to faith daily as they watched the lives that the first Christians were living every day. Every day, Luke says. I want you to see again the way that chapter 2 concludes. Each day they were meeting, continuing to meet together in the temple courts, breaking bread in their homes, eating together with glad and sincere hearts, and now catch this part right here. Because of the way they were living, again, remember, others are watching, others are paying attention, right? Because of the way they were living, they enjoyed the favor of all the people. Not just those who had come to Jesus, not yet anyway, because again, remember, daily these people are coming to Jesus. They enjoyed the favor of all the people. As people were watching, they said there's something incredibly compelling about this new community of new believers who've got a new life, an entirely new way of living, so compelling that, again, every day, just by watching the way these people lived, people came to the point where they said, I I want that too. I want that too. So I want to ask you a quick question, and we're going to look at another couple of other examples here, but the first time I want to ask you this question in this form. And I want you to think about this just for a second, okay? What kind of story would the first Christians have told you about God by the way they lived? Just just think on that for a second. What kind of story, if you were watching, if you were observing, what kind of story, how would you interpret that story anyway? The story that the first Christians were telling just by the way they lived in relation to others. 
You know, Jesus often spent his time as well traveling from place to place, doing incredible things, living among people, feeding people. I mean, a lot of what Jesus did was to also tell a story about his father. I love Mark's gospel. What stands out to me about Mark's gospel is Mark shows Jesus as a man of action who is going from place to place doing incredible things, certainly for the first eight chapters. It's after the first eight chapters that Mark kind of shows Jesus starting to really preach a whole lot more. But up until that time, he's been showing Jesus performing miracles all over the place. It's incredible. I mean, if you want to read an action-packed gospel, start in Mark and work all the way from Mark 1 all the way through Mark 8. And you will be amazed by the constant action, the movement of Jesus, all that he was doing. And as I watch Jesus... What I wonder and what I see at times, I I see this guy who was doing incredible things and loving people in incredible ways, but then sharing something even bigger with people. You know, there even comes a time where where Jesus kind of gets on some folks because they're following him because he's fed them before with food, right? He's fed them. And that's what they want. They want to be fed again with food. But Jesus says, I've got something else for you that's so much better than this bread. With this bread, you could survive for a day. But I've got something so much better for you that will give you eternal life. That, that's what I want for you. In fact, the reality is, John gives this kind of summary statement of his entire gospel at the end of John. What's wild about this is it falls, at the, uh, it falls in this chapter where Jesus has been raised from the dead which, which is incredible, right? Jesus has now been engaging, now raised from the dead. Jesus has performed many, many miracles throughout his time, his ministry on earth. And here's what John says about all of what has just now happened. John says in chap- chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, he says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. John says this is only a taste of what Jesus did as he walked the earth. It's only a taste of the miracles and of the signs and the wonders that he performed in the presence of his disciples. He says they're not recorded in this book. But the ones that are recorded here, John says, these, the ones that are written, are written why? So that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, And that by believing, you may have life in his name. So even Jesus, the way he lived, the way he engaged with others, it was purposeful. It was so that people would come to believe in him and believe that he was the son of God. In fact, I love the fact that John uses this word signs. There's another word that he could have used here to point out miracles. But he says says signs. These were signs. It was almost like a billboard saying, look here. See here what's going on. It's a sign of something. It's pointing to something. It's pointing to a bigger story, trying to pull people in, compel someone to something so that you would believe in him. So I want to ask you, if you think about Jesus just for a little bit, what kind of a story would Jesus have told you about God by the way that he lived? Let me think on that for just a second. As we think about this man who walked the earth, God in flesh, performing miracles as he went, loving people as he went, sharing the good news of the kingdom as he went, what kind of a story would he have told you about God by the way that he lived? So then that moves us to us, right? In the first century, there were many communications to Christians that that they ought to live in such a way that that compels others. There's no doubt about it. But I think perhaps the best one, maybe the most prominent one, is found in 1 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to look at that in just a second. As we think about the first Christian community and the way they lived, it was so compelling it drew others in. As we think about the way Jesus lived, his life was so compelling. For the last 2,000 years, it's been drawing people in. He's been drawing people to him. 
What about us? Is, is that our call as well, to live like those first Christians, to live like Jesus, live in such a way that draws people to us and then points people to Jesus? Well, this is what the Apostle Peter said about this in 1 Peter 2, 12. He says, here's what we should be doing in our lives. Here's how we should be living. He says, live such good lives among the pagans that even though they accuse you of doing wrong, you know, this points out something that, that I think sometimes we wrestle with as, as followers of Jesus, especially when we look at the first few chapters of Acts. Right? We look at what happened in the first few chapters of Acts and we see the way these people were living and people were being drawn to them. It's amazing. And we want that exact same kind of reception in our community today. We'd like to have that, right? If we flip just a few pages further in the book of Acts, we see that that didn't really last. In fact, it wasn't very long before one of their most prominent leaders is arrested And as he's preaching this message, they start throwing rocks at him until he dies. So yes, there was a time when they enjoyed the favor of the people. And then there was a time when they didn't enjoy the favor of the people and the leaders, but they didn't stop. It wasn't because they were all of a sudden doing something different. They were doing the same thing. What is compelling to some may not be compelling to others. Or maybe it was still compelling, but it causes a different reaction based upon how people receive it. And Peter is very frank about that, especially now as Peter is writing to a group of people who are going to be enduring more persecution. Peter says, don't stop living such compelling and good lives just because there are going to be people who don't like it. It's going to be life to some. It's going to smell like life to some. And to others, it's going to smell like death. But you live that kind of a life anyway, Peter says. He says, because what can happen is this, as you live such good lives among the pagans that even though some of them will look at you and say, I'm going to accuse you of wrongdoing, at some point in time they may recognize that what they thought was wrong was actually good. And in that time, as you've been pointing them to a good God, maybe finally they will give glory to that good God as well. In a sense, what Peter says is in the eyes of those who are watching us, there's a direct connection between the lives we lead and the glory of God. Or at least whether or not we believe that God is glorious. And so the same question we asked of the early Christian community, the same question we asked of Jesus, we need to ask of ourselves as well. And hopefully it's a compelling question that causes us to live in a compelling way. What kind of story are we telling others about God by the way we live? That's that's the question we're going to be asking this month. What kind of a story am I telling others about God by the way I live, by the way I talk, by my generosity or lack of it? What kind of a story am I telling about God? We began this morning with this statement. We should live in such a way that compels others to take notice. Even as we talk about discipleship and disciple making here at Grace Chapel, one of the things that I've really appreciated about it, and it wasn't immediately clear on the front end at first, but we talk about discipleship beginning, just as any relationship does with curiosity, with, with wondering. And the story I shared as we began this morning, the first time I saw my wife, I was instantly curious. I I wondered about her. I don't think she was instantly curious about me. Took a while to convince her that she should be curious, right? But as we live in this world, we ought to live in such a way, believers, as we're looking to make disciples, we don't need to put the pressure of the world upon our shoulders. There's only one who can carry the weight of the world on his shoulders, and that was Jesus. But you and I are called to play our parts by living in such a way that just maybe moves someone to be curious for the first time. 
living in such a way that invites the right kind of questions. Why, why do you live like that? Why do you believe that? Why do you care about others the way you care about others? Why did you just give that up for someone else? Why? And the beauty of that is a relationship with God begins with that kind of curiosity. Wondering why people would live the way they do, wondering why God would love us the way he does. It begins with those questions. They're questions that demand an answer. And as those we live among take notice, our lives will begin to give some of those answers as we look to live in a way that tells a story. I want to pray over us as we launch into this month further that, again, that God will just keep working in your heart this week. And that you may be convicted, convinced, that you may be desirous of living your life in such a way this week that points others to the goodness of a good God. Let's pray. God, first, I'm just, um, I'm personally humbled just at the thought that, that the way I live tells people something about you. And God, first, I'm convicted that there are times where I have lived in a way that didn't communicate a good message about you. And I, I just, I just in this moment want to repent of that, to, to, to do differently for the sake of your glory and your good name. So Father, I pray first for those who, like me, may be experiencing that, that feeling this morning. This knowledge that we don't always live in a way that points people to you well or that doesn't tell the right story about you. But God, I thank you so much as, as the Apostle Peter in Acts 2 gave that first sermon, that first gospel sermon in his words when the crowd asked, what can we do? The first word was repent, which means that there is a chance to change and do things differently. Whatever we've done in the past, God, you have an entirely new future for us. I'm so thankful for that. And so, Father, I pray for anyone who may be struggling with any guilt over not living in a way that tells the right story, that, Father, you would reassure them that through your power, from here on out, they can. But, God, I also want to pray as we live our lives in such a way that people, that others will take notice, that you will open doors. As Colossians 2 Colossians 4, 2 through 4 says that you will open doors for your message as people become curious and take notice. As we seek to be disciples who make disciples. Father, help us live in such a way that others take notice and we can share your goodness with them. I know this is the desire of my heart and I know it's the desire of many hearts here this morning that that would be the story of our lives as we point to the story of your goodness. Father, we need your help in this, so thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit who walks this path with us. We thank you for Jesus who showed us an example of what this look like, looks like, and it's in his name that we together as the church pray and say, amen.